Hi, I'm Debbie Moraes, and this is Legal Matters, a program designed to address the critical issues facing consumers and businesses today. It's legal information, practical solutions, and straight talk about a wide variety of topics, ranging from family and finance to social security, workers' compensation, and more. In every segment, we invite our viewers to email in questions from last session's topic, we invite them to email at dbazar, B-A-Z-A-R, at abcglawfirm.com. And we do have some responses. And our last topic was about an aspect of family law, juvenile and, and adoption. And David and Jackie are with us to answer the questions, present and answer the questions, which are? Well, we have a question from the last show, which was about uh, custody. And it was from a woman who is a grandmother. And the question was, she has a 13-year-old granddaughter, and her son is going through the divorce. And the granddaughter has a preference of living with the father. And she wanted to know whether that granddaughter would have any input into that decision. All right, I'll take a stab at that. Uh, usually, if a child is 13 or more, depending on the maturity level, they do have a say doesn't mean that the court will agree with them, but they do. Ha they will take into consideration the child's wishes. That's true in Rhode Island, Massachusetts. Yes. And again, it's, it, there's not a set age, but I think generally it's anywhere between 12 or 13. Um, and again, you have to consider the maturity level of the child. The court will um, assess whether the child's at a maturity level that allows a meaningful input if it's because the judge thinks the child wants to live with one, there's been certain promises, you know, of toys or whatever, mm -hmm. they'll see through that, and that won't be given, given any consideration. But if there's a valid reason, as Jackie says, it's mm -hmm. one of many issues that the court can look at in determining custody. Mm -hmm. Is that usually something where the judge is talking to the child as opposed to, to lawyers or parents and lawyers talking to the child? Well, I, I think most judges take the position that having a child in the courtroom is not the best thing to do. Um, as a matter of fact, very rarely do you see a child in the courtroom. Chambers? Um, on occasion. On occasion, on occasion, but again, um, they are not fans of uh, encouraging testimony from a child in a courtroom because it's a traumatic right. thing. It's a traumatic uh, thing. Generally, a guardian ad litem is appointed yeah. who will act as the child's spokesman and will meet with the child and the parents and make a recommendation to the court. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, we said we plan to cover a wide variety of critical issues and timely issues. Talk about topics. This time, it's a hot topic. Finally, we're going to address personal injury. Um, I know that there is uh, a lengthy and growing list of potential sources of why people have personal injury cases. So I know it's also associated with tort. What is that about? Give us an explanation. I'm going to let the expert answer well, that. Well, tort law is um, a name that covers a wide variety of civil wrongs as opposed to criminal wrongs. A civil wrong could be if I accidentally hit Jackie um, and I hurt her. That could be considered a battery, perhaps. Um, it's an unwanted touching. Uh, tort law also covers negligence, which is what we're primarily talking about when we talk about personal injury, whether it's an auto accident because of someone's negligence or a slip and fall because the property owner was negligent in maintaining their property um, or any type of injury to a person. So we're going to use for our purposes today tort law to mean negligence and talk about negligent case, Keep negligence it narrow. cases. All right. Narrowly focused. Right. Because, as I said, tort law does cover a wide variety of civil wrongs. Well, if people have a complaint about something that accidentally happened, why can't they just keep it between themselves? I hurt myself, you didn't mean it to happen, I had to have something fixed, and we're done. Well, society wants to make sure that the person who's injured has a redress for their injuries. Uh, if we're talking about... Um, somebody was hurt with a very minor injury and they just have a few medical bills, oftentimes those are kept between the people. Um, you don't need to go to a lawyer for something minor. What we deal with is more of a catastrophic injury or a major injury where someone has um, some serious injury that affects their ability to earn money, their... Um, Live their lives. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Their social life is disrupted, all of that. That's when lawyers will become involved. How many times do you find that someone has actually just had a minor issue, but they're not really sure 
how long it will take them to recover or what really is involved in that and then they come to see you and then it becomes the case when it might not have become the case if they had just gone to the hospital to the doctor and finished it up i mean does having a conversation with you actually end up making it more of a protracted issue than it needed to be at times I don't mean you in particular, but like in general? Like anything in the law, it depends. As People will come in uh, maybe after a period of several months, uh, and they try and handle the case on their own, for instance, and they realize that their discussions with the insurance adjuster are not very um, fruitful. So they believe that by hiring an attorney, they may be able to get adequate representation, of course, and they may be able to garner more money from uh, having the law firm <clears throat> discuss something with an attorney. If you're hurt and it's because of someone else's negligence, we would always encourage you to speak to a lawyer earlier rather than later because the insurance company, even though they may seem like your friend, is not your friend. They're not trying to make sure you're compensated for everything you're entitled to. They're trying to save money for their policyholders or for their stockholders or because they get extra gold stars on their reports at the end of the day when they <laughs> save money. So if you're hurt, you should see an attorney. Now an attorney may make um, a judgment when you come in that it's not the type of case that you need representation for and they'll tell you that. But if it is the type of case you need a lawyer for, the lawyer can protect your rights right from the beginning rather than waiting till you've given a statement that they're going to use against you and they get you to say something that you shouldn't have said um, or that they twist a word or something that you say. You don't want to represent yourself even if it's um, a potential case that may seem like it's minor at the beginning but you don't know what the medical is going to bring until you go through your treatment. Well, I guess once someone decides that there needs to be some sort of action, a legal action, um, we all know that there are lawyers, many lawyers, who love just this particular area of specialty. Um, and lawyers of different stripes, none need to be mentioned, doesn't really matter. But knowing that there is such an issue that uh, has made this so lucrative for lawyers, understandably, how does someone who has a problem know what kind of, which lawyer is, how do you evaluate a good lawyer versus one who says, this is my specialty because you've heard it, read it, seen it in the newspaper, on TV, and they become very popular and associated with it. How does someone who is unsuspecting and able to evaluate that? I really think it should be word of mouth. You need to speak with other people that have hired that law firm. You yourself would be your own advocate when you go in to see an attorney. You ask the attorney, do you specialize in this type of area, although you can't specialize specifically in Rhode yes. Island. But uh, how many personal injury cases have you handled? How many years have you practiced? Have you ever gone to trial? The person has to be their own advocate, but at the same time, um, we don't like to say, pick somebody out of the yellow pages. That's not always the best. Um, but the ones who've handled most of those, or many of those personal injury cases, are also many of times the ones that we hear the bad stories about, the ones who are just in it for the money or whatever. So what's, they've had the experience, they answer that correct Mm -hmm. question correctly, but how do you do that? I think it's important to Evaluation. meet the attorney face to face. And Jackie's 100% right. Word of mouth referrals from, that's how Jackie and I get most of our referrals. We don't advertise on TV or with big yellow page ads. Not that there's anything wrong Not with that. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and in fact, I was going to say, some of the people who do advertise are actually very good lawyers. But you have to meet with those people face to face and get a feel for yourself whether or not you're comfortable with them, whether or not you think they can represent your interest, and whether or not that's the person you would want going to court for you if it had to go to court. So there's no, usually, fee for meeting with an attorney on a personal injury case for an initial consultation. Use that initial consultation if you need to talk to more than one attorney to make sure you're comfortable with whoever it is you end up hiring. That's what I would do. Interview the person, let them explain to you what they're going to do, and then make sure you're comfortable. It's that relationship between the attorney and the client that's most important so that you're comfortable, that they're honest, they have integrity, and they're going to work for you.